Street City Manager's Office and welcome to this uh, Digital Inclusion Week presentation with uh, my sidewalk. Uh, this is the KC Connectivity Report. We have uh, Nora and Zawi and Nick Kaufman with my sidewalk with us and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, this uh, this report uh, it's been developed earlier this year and it's really helped us be able to show um, folks that we're trying to describe the digital divide in Kansas City, we're, how we're trying to describe that to others in the community as support for ongoing programs. This report has been very useful in that. So uh, Nora, I'll let you uh, tell us a bit about uh, my sidewalk and, and what you've been doing on the report. Sure, thanks Rick. Thank I'm going to go ahead and lay out the agenda and then have Nick, since he has so much expertise, explain my sidewalk, go into that before he gets it back to me. Uh, but the agenda for today is the introduction to my sidewalk and who we are, what the KC Connectivity Report is. We're going to take a dive into that data and then see how it can be used to address digital inequity in the region. And we'll leave five to 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Great. All right, Nick. All right, thanks, Nora. And thanks, Rick, for inviting us to uh, talk about this important topic. So super briefly about my sidewalk. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, that's okay. We're a Kansas City-based company, uh, typically located at 8th and Central area next to the Phoenix. Uh, our team has been we're, uh, working remotely for the last couple months, like I'm sure a lot of you have as well. Um, but just a couple things about what we believe in. We believe that data has the power to make a better world. Uh, we believe that wholeheartedly, and we've seen that happen with a lot of our customers in their respective communities. Today, we have a chance to talk specifically about one report in our hometown, and, and Nora will walk us through that. Um, we think that the work that we get to do every day is to equip change makers. So that's city manager office in KC, that's public health departments across the country, that's public safety and firefighters all across the country. Um, and then the work that we get to do is democratize data. So um, over the last couple of years, we've helped build this, uh, what we call a city intelligence platform. And so we've uh, continued to just um, aggregate and update and uh, make data easy to access for every community in the country. What that looks like is now probably about 3,500 different data indicators from a variety of sources that our partners and customers are using to help with uh, thinking about resource allocation during and in post pandemic. They're thinking about how do we help uh, improve turnout times for our uh, for our fire service. They're thinking about to advocate and inform our stakeholders. And so you can see on this slide, there's a lot of data that we've collected that serves uh, about every function across local government. Um, but the the purpose of our conversation today is to really go uh, more deeply on a report. Uh, that's going to talk about the digital divide that exists in Kansas City. Nora and our team helped build this. They did a great job with it. Um, so, do uh, Nora, you can you can take it from here. <laughs> All right, great, thanks, Nick. So, the KC Connectivity Report, which is what we're here for, is kind of an overview. What happened? and how it kind of came to be. I'll try and keep this narrative short, but my neighbor is Tom Esselman for Connecting for Good. And um, so I've known him for quite some time and I heard him on NPR at the very beginning of the pandemic talking about the work he was doing with the digital divide. And I called him up after I heard it and I was like, hey, Tom, you know you know what I do because he understands that um, I work at my sidewalk, I'm a data analyst. And he was struggling to figure out what to do with all these kids out of school and where they were going to put these buses and if they were going to route them with Wi-Fi, how they were going to get their meals. And so I just said, hey, let me let me just draft you a couple maps of ideas I have about how you could maybe use some data to figure out what you need to do to allocate these resources. And then 
well, this came to fruition. I guess um, the KC Coalition for Digital Inclusion, he shared that with you folks, some of my like original maps. And we ended up partnering with them and the Lean Lab Education to investigate where these digital inequities are most prevalent in the community and why these tools were so necessary to work and learn from during this lockdown era. So the report was basically created as like a comprehensive needs assessment um, to be used for different stakeholders and city government, local organizations, school districts, and um, for policy makers. But the My Sidewalk, My Sidewalk Interactive Platform, we use that to explore the digital divide down to the census tract level in order to identify these key barriers that uh, make up digital inequities like lack of internet access, um, areas where people are in poverty and there are no internet providers, households without uh, computers, and then identify potential areas for opportunity to bridge that connection, like um, putting hotspot routers on bus stops or utilizing a school or a library, which we've already seen, to provide those resources to community residents. So go ahead and take a look. So as you mentioned, Rick, we have uh, reports for I think all the counties in the metro area now, but this was the initial report and it's for Kansas City, Missouri proper. And the report basically, it just kind of outlines what, why COVID-19 has impacted the digital device. So, um, to such a great degree and what it means for people as far as making a living, getting education and accessing uh, social resources in a time where we rely heavily on internet use. And so it begins just kind of by, you know, giving a synopsis of why this is so important at this moment in time. I think Lean Lab gave us this video and why giving just like an idea of why the digital divide exists and it's a mixture of things such as infrastructure financial and cultural barriers um, that impact the access that many get basic information day to day so we cut it in kind of as to like where the divide is located who's affected what are those barriers in that divide who's affected and where the opportunities are so we created kind of like an index for census tracts by council district of three indicators we felt were the most, um, had the heaviest impression on what makes up the digital divide. And so that being households without internet access, households that are below the poverty level and households without a computer. So here we took the top 10 census tracts and ranked them on the percentage of how heavily they're affected by digital inequities, and then also break it out by those indicators. And you can see that in this preliminary map where we did actually include um, Truist Avenue for all of us Kansas Cityers, we know very well, that is a marker as to a lot of the socioeconomic disparities that we've experienced today and had 50 years ago, and kind of what makes up a lot of the barriers to that digital divide. These yellow census tracts are highlighted. These are just the top 10 that suffer from um, these digital inequities the most, and that will be highlighted throughout the rest of the report. So here's where we kind of see the main barriers to what compromises the digital divide. We look at households without internet access or computer access in the Kansas City, Missouri area. This is really important because out as we know it right now. And so without having internet um, or a household near your computer, it's very difficult to do things like log into work or learn remotely. And so we have just kind of like a bivariate map, so to speak, of the Kansas City area, overlapping households without internet access in conjunction with those below the poverty level. And the areas that are in the darkest purple, which happen to land, in those census tracts that we've mentioned before are the ones that are the most effect, like that have the highest percentages of residents without internet and without computers. 
And these disparities get pretty big, and you can see a lot of it is naturally uh, east of Truist Avenue. Another interesting, I found this really interesting indicator, but looking at houses with only cellular internet access, because those, and you can see this by council district, council district three, which I know over, overlaps, or it's actually, I think it is east of truth, but having a cell phone is pretty normal. Having a cell phone to rely on for internet only has become um, kind of the only means of getting internet access for a lot of like, lower income populations. So looking at households with only a smartphone device and below the poverty level, you can see that the majority of those census tracts land east of truth and are again highlighted in the areas that are the most effective. This is really important because when you have to work from home or you're doing school or you're trying to find a job, the interface of the cell phone, like you can't fill out a resume in the same manner that you can on a computer. You can't carry out the activities that you can with that interface. It's just not optimized for it. And so I felt like that was a very important indicator to include when we're talking about the, you know, the socioeconomic disparities um, related to internet access. And then we do take a look also at internet providers. Just to get an idea of like by council district, how many options you have for an internet provider and households with internet subscription. So then we go to who is affected by the divide. And namely, the four populations we focused on were students, families that had children under the age of five, um, biracial and ethnic group, and also just low income populations in general. And what I found very interesting. You can see almost 5,000 kids just in um, District 3 and 4 are without computers and without internet access. And um, yeah, let's see that. So nearly half of this population. So you think about these kids that are under the age of 18 and 50% of them aren't able to go to school and they can't even work from home and do school. It, it hinders, it has short and long-term consequences. And that's something that we definitely wanna look at as far as like policy going forward, because this is not, there is no short-term solution to this. We've been working on it for a while, but now more than ever, these long-term impacts of not being able to learn um, and not being able to work do to the pandemic and the circumstances at hand is something we need to look at. And then the opportunity areas I found was fascinating. We looked at like number of bus stops and population density in the Kansas City metro area. Because if you consider, if you are, you know, working on transit or you are trying to get push, you know, the city to have um, buses carry more like Wi-Fi hotspots on them, looking at how dense the population is and you know, trying to make the case, hey, you will connect, if you put a hotspot on this bus stop, for five hours, you will connect X amount of people with uh, Wi-Fi in this area that wouldn't normally have it. And that kind of, that same case can be made for internet providers, trying to incentivize maybe like Google Fiber, who is not, I don't think, completely metro wide and advocate, hey, you are gonna have so many more um, consumers that are here without internet access if you just give this apartment building, um, you know, you link up fiber to this apartment building. So it incentivizes them as well. And in light of Casey, uh, the Kansas City School District, we had taken a look at like where all the schools were, the branches of the public library, which offered Wi-Fi. And then also the schools that were providing meals for students. And we had like the student meal distribution, what time of the day it was, and how many kids were enrolled in school, kindergarten to grade 12, to give um, the school district an idea of just where uh, school age population was most prevalent, where they could get access to the internet if it was needed, and meal distribution. 
And then following this, we have um, just some resources that organizations provided as far as like internet access. Um, there was a hotspot request form that uh, the Kansas City School District sent out and um, organizations that have engaged in bridging the divide point of the coalition and have um, given us some feedback and helped us with the build of this report. So going back to digital inequity in the region, the purpose of my sidewalk in this report specifically is how to use this data to drive action because now that we have to pinpoint our efforts, um, it's just more important than ever that we have to we have to continue addressing the support of our schools and addressing these digital inequities and the looming need for sustaining the livability of the local lo the local workforce. Because as far as we can see, there aren't going to be any changes anytime soon as far as normalcy. And being able to connect these people with the internet resources that they need is detrimental to the economy at large. This data can also, like we've seen, showcase the barriers and impacts of digital inequities for stakeholders at every level, level to incentivize community action and change. It doesn't really matter if you're a policymaker or someone that's in a school district or community organization, someone, everyone can find value through their own lens into how this can help them and help the community they're trying to serve. And it also does showcase how there can be the short and long-term impacts of using data to measure community needs and allocate resources towards closing the digital divide. So, um, yeah, do you have any questions? Co question time. Rick, would you like to see anything else? Oh, I can't hear you, Rick. I'll just expand on um, your conversations about uh, Google Fiber and internet services in some of these neighborhoods. We have um, other mapping that Exact has completed. There's a digital divide map uh, that they created. And you can move the cursor around by census tract, and it tells you fastest advertised speeds um, by yeah. that provider. And what you'll find there is that Google Fiber is pretty much available in almost every neighborhood in Kansas City um, at gigabit speed. I, I would really discuss um, like other providers like AT&T. Uh, when you put your street address in in some neighborhoods in the third district, you'll find that all you can get is like one and a half megabit speed internet services. Mm -hmm. and, their uh, gigabit service is, is not available in these neighborhoods. Uh, Spectrum has pretty broadly available 300 megabit to 200 to 300 megabit, megabit speed services. So uh, what is unique to Kansas City, and you know, this video, like I say, I was going to put it on YouTube so others around the country will see this, is the multitude of internet service providers that we have. Uh, I was talking with Philadelphia, a few weeks ago, they have Comcast, and that's about it. We've got a, a competitive market. Your report shows that you know who's out there and um, and and what you can subscribe to. So we we have a real opportunity, and you know the the other efforts ongoing with the Coalition for Digital Inclusion. And there was another seminar yesterday that Aaron Deacon gave about the. Um, payment assistance program for internet services that's being developed with Mid-America Assistance Coalition. Um, we're, we're working pretty hard through the coalition to uh, really implement a lot more of these programs. Yeah. I think we've got another, some more folks have joined us. Um, uh, Bob Akers, so Bob, Bob uh, left us for Seattle. He's come home here again recently. Uh, and then uh, Lazone Grays is our friend from Topeka. Hello, Lazone, if you guys want to say hi. Uh, hi, Rick, how you doing? This is Bob. Good. Hey, Bob. It's good um, to be back in Kansas City. All right. Yeah, we, we heard. About the <laughs> Hello, everyone. Lazone from Topeka, Kansas. Hello, Lazone, good to hear you. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us. Um, 
So, well, now that we have some news people, continue, Ray. No, I was going to just see if anybody had any any questions for you or, or Nick. I, again, really appreciate you taking the time to explain the report. I had tabbed through a lot of those things, so it's really even been very useful for me to see the stuff that you've, you've put in there that we can access. Absolutely. And I actually, um, for those of you that joined kind of late, uh, this slide deck, which also connects to the report, I'm going to go ahead and drop that link into the chat. It should be viewable for all of you. Yeah, I just, Nora, I just added it to the chat. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, do you mind if I share that on the Facebook page and the LinkedIn post as well then? And Yeah. Not at all. Yeah, go for it. Oh, the link to the report. Okay, is this the slideshow? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the slideshow, but, um, well, for the context in case you needed it, the report link is in there. It's on slide uh, six. It oh, says yeah. the data. Yeah. You got that. You have that link anyways, right? Yeah, I've, shared the, I've shared the heck out of that already, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, and then we talked to you talked about the other counties in the region. Um, we've, uh, you know, looking at CARES Act dollars expenditures. Um, Johnson County has a digital access uh, strike team. They're calling it that is launching an initiative. The, the, the uh, digital, I'm sorry, the uh, Internet Assistance Payment Payment Assistance Program. They're putting uh, $550,000 into that. Uh, the local COVID-19 relief fund is putting $230,000 into that. So um, we've been trying to reach out to Jackson County to uh, to get them to engage with us. If you could pull up those two Which counties. Do let's, let's do Johnson County first, just to give folks an idea of what the digital divide looks there versus Kansas City and Jackson County. Sure. So here we've got Johnson, and this one's a bit, um, it's not as detailed with that kind of custom data just because Johnson County is not k uh, It was easier to templatize for all the counties. Let's see here. It certainly is a lot. I mean, relative to the KCMO area, the difference is a lot more stark as far as those with internet access. And what were you mentioning, Rick, about what they were implementing? Uh, the, so the county in their uh, CARES Act uh, funding, they have a uh, the digital access strike team and there's a, mm -hmm. a funding that, that's being allocated into that for some digital equity efforts and so $550,000 of that will be going into this internet uh, payment assistance program so that uh, the, the parameters they've set up is that uh, households that make 200% or less of federal poverty level mm -hmm. will um, be eligible to receive funding to help pay like past due accounts or to pay for new accounts on internet services. Uh, and then the, that that 550 is available just in Johnson County. The 230,000 out of the COVID relief fund is uh, has a larger footprint, so Kansas City, Missouri residents could take advantage of that. Um, sure. My concern is that you can see from this uh, reporting that the demand uh, is certainly much higher in Kansas City, Missouri, and Johnson Jackson County, Missouri than say in yeah. Johnson County. So I'm trying to, you know, find some ways to fund that opportunity, but it's it's uh hasn't hasn't been we haven't had any success there. Hi Rick, this is Leslie. Um maybe I'm just confused, but I went to the link that's in the chat and it doesn't have the data at the beginning of it. It it looks like it's it's like the the actual reports versus the the demo that we saw. Just curious if that is publicly accessible. Nick, did you share the link to the report or the slide? 
He shared it to the report, Arizona, but yeah. sure, yeah. But would I'm, you like? I mean, when I look at, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure when I look at your URL, it says data.mysidewalk.com. Huh. Oh, I wonder if it's because I was logged in when I shared the report. Um, do you want to drop All the right. report that you have, Nora? Yeah. Sorry about that, Leslie. Yeah. Like, no, uh, that's, that's okay. It's just I did. I guess I just didn't see um, the interactivity um, function yeah. on that. Yeah. So, Let, let's no, try it's, that. It's yeah. the same one that that Nora dropped in. So I'm just missing something. I'll look at it again. Okay. Um, Leslie, I'm happy to maybe follow up with you yeah. to make sure that we get that to you if you're able to share your email uh, in the chat. I will. I'll do that right okay. now. Thank okay. you so okay. much. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sorry, okay, not Leslie. as I mentioned at the beginning, we're, you know, we're having conversations, the, the Chamber of Commerce, the Civic Council, Mid-America Regional Council, all are expressing interest in digital equity. And so this this tool is very useful in you know quickly demonstrating to, to uh, policymakers or civic leadership you know where um, the digital divide is impacting our community the most. Um, the, another uh, thing that of course we're very aware of at the city is um, how um, the community health improvement plan. And the dashboard that you did there on life zip codes, mm -hmm. um, just you know the health disparities. Um, I mean, it's it's practically the same maps with just a different legend and some different reporting on on health outcomes. So, we have uh, included our health department in some of the work we've been doing on our digital equity plan, and um, trying to you know find more ways to bring economic mobility opportunities to residents you know through internet services yeah absolutely I, it's all i mean very interrelated and like you said we can see that by looking at the different reports and indicators access to resources is restrained in very local like certain localized areas and, and we know that and acknowledge that and so it, it definitely gives more momentum to try it and it's, it's incentivize that change. Oh. Well, does anyone okay. else have uh, questions for, for Nora or Nick while we're here? All right, well, I, I thank you again for making the presentation. And uh, like I discussed, I'll, I'll, I'll be posting this on the uh, Include KC YouTube channel. So if you're watching there, be sure to like share and comment i don't know how they do that <laughs> you know, so we'll all try right. to get uh, get some more viewing here so all right well uh thanks so much thanks everybody right, thank have you. a great day thanks for your time Bye. great work guys thank you bye